Okay, we're going to talk about superposition of waves today. It's the last chapter that we're doing on uh, waves before we start with this new magnetism. And so superposition really is just a simple addition of waves. If we have two waves that are um, basically, you know, you can think of them oscillating on a string, and you have another wave that's going to uh, oscillate on the same string. Um, in this case, the two waves are exactly in sync, in phase with each other. And so we just go through and add the amplitude of each uh, of the two waves at every point, right? So they're both at um, a maximum at the same time. So we get a maximum, they're both going down to the uh, minimum and then back up maximum and so on. And so the amplitude of this resultant wave will be twice the amplitude of this input wave. Um, you can have a, the opposite case where the top wave is hitting a, a peak and the bottom one is at the trough, right? And so then actually if we add the peak and the trough, we get to zero and everywhere along the string, if we're imagining these are waves on a string, they, the amplitudes would cancel and you get nothing out. So it's called destructive interference. And then you can have waves that are slightly out of phase and you would again, just go through and sum the amplitude at each point and it would give you the resultant wave there. So this is interference, just how the two waves combine together. Okay. When a wave hits, uh, uh, a boundary, it can either, um, it will reflect actually, it'll bounce back, right? Uh, if the boundary is fixed, like this rope is tied to the wall, the wave comes here, um, the wave pulse is kind of trying to pull up on the wall, but the wall will exert a downward uh, force equal and opposite to that. And so that causes the wave to invert and then it reflects back. So um, we can use this FET simulation to just show what that looks like. So uh, we'll start with a fixed end. So I can add a, a wave pulse and we'll see it travel down this string and there it inverted. Okay, I'll try that again, let me start. It's the fixed end and it inverts. Okay, now we can change it when we start there and change it to a loose end and send the pulse down. And there it actually doesn't invert, right? It comes back on the same. Uh, so let's restart that again. So it starts above the axis, hits the pole, and comes back that way too. So if we let's try and um, pause it right there. So it's getting to the. Okay. So in this case, um, because it's not tied in a fixed way to the the pole, the pole can't exert a downward force that would help invert the wave, right? So the wave just travels up and then it comes back down under its own gravity, right? And, and hits back out the other way. So it's still reflected, but it's uh, it's not inverted as it's reflected. Okay. Okay, you can also have a boundary effect. There we go, I got out of it. Phew, I was stuck in a little uh, zoom in mode. Okay, you can also have uh, boundary um, effects when the density of the material changes. So if you go from a, a heavy string, let's say to a um, thinner string, uh, the wave will get transmitted, some will get reflected as well. And in this case, it acts like a free end. So the wave is not inverted. Uh, coming back here, the reflected wave would be on the same side. And then if you're going from a lighter material to a denser material, the transmitted wave stays in the same orientation, right? But you get a reflection here and this acts like a fixed boundary, you get a inverted pulse. So when you have uh, waves of a certain, um, or objects of a certain length, you can actually set up something called standing waves. And, um, and every, string or uh, instrument has some natural frequencies associated with it. So um, you've probably done this like with a slinky or jump rope maybe, um, you know, you can kind of swing it up, move your hand up and down, swing it up and down, and you can actually get all the rope to go, you know, down at once and then up and then down. These pictures are a little confusing because it's not in all of these places, right? I mean, at any one instance of time, the rope is down and then it would be, you know, coming back up through the equilibrium and up again, right? but the whole thing is kind of oscillating in a coherent way, up and down and up and down. And then if you were shaking your, um, uh, 
If you are um, shaking it even faster, you can actually set up a standing wave that looks like this. So the wave would be in this position and then it would be in this in-between one and then back through equilibrium and eventually you get back to this uh, wave. And then if you shake it even faster, you can try and even create three uh, little packets of waves here. Okay, I'm gonna make a standing wave on the spring. So uh, one end is fixed and then I'm just oscillating this one and you can see that I get half wavelength standing there. And now if I go to different frequency, I don't get the wave set up. But if I go at the right frequency that corresponds to the length of the spring and the, the properties of the spring, I can get a standing wave. And now I'm going to try and go faster and get a full wavelength on it. Like that, right? So we can see the full wave uh, on the spring now. All right. And I'm not going to try and do three. So the geometry here is pretty straightforward, right? If you have a uh, and maybe it's, it's actually marked up on this diagram better. But if you have a string of length L, right, the longest wavelength standing wave you can set up is this one where the length of the string is equal to half of the wavelength, right? Because one wavelength is going to be um, like a sine curve, right? So, you know, keep in mind we're talking that's a full wavelength. And so in this case, we only have half of the wavelength. So right here, right, the... Um, length of the string is one half the wavelength. And then uh, the next um, shorter wavelength is you can actually get a full wave oscillating here, right? So it goes up and then it will come down that way. Um, and in that case, the length of the string will be equal to the wavelength. And then again, you can even add another wave packet and get, um, so you've gone through a full wavelength here and then another half, right? So you have a, uh, Three halves, lambda. Okay. Okay. So this, um, we, when you think of any kind of stringed instrument like a, um, a guitar or piano or a um, violin, cello, basically this is this is how they are um, creating different tones. So you can have, I mean, there's, there's actually lots of ways to do it, right? You can change the density of this string, or you can actually move your finger up and down the fret to change how long string, the part of the string is it's going to oscillate, and that will change the pitch. But if we just look at one fixed length uh, rope, right? So we have, um, like we said, we have this fundamental as the first harmonic. Um, and so in this case, right, we said that the length of the, of the string is uh, one half the wavelength of um, the wave that's oscillating, and this has an associated frequency with it. Uh, when you go up to the next harmonic and get a full uh, wave oscillating, our wavelength has doubled, our, our wavelength has gotten, uh, gotten in half, and our frequency doubles. And then same thing for the third harmonic, your frequency is going to be three times um, the fundamental. And so just keep in mind, right, so for all waves we have velocity, equals frequency times wavelength. Okay, so the velocity is going to be the same. And as we change the wavelength, we get a corresponding change in frequency. Here. Okay, so this is all basically just saying, you know, if I, um, if I um, decrease my wavelength by a factor of two, I have to increase my frequency by a factor of two. Okay, so string instruments are a little different. Some of them, it depends on the instrument, some of them are um, considered open at both ends. So the flute is one example of this. Um, and now we're talking, rather than sort of waves oscillating on a string, we're talking about pressure waves of sound um, that are resonating inside some kind of closed cavity. So. The key thing to keep in mind is that when you have an open end on the pipe, you get an anti-node of the wave. And if you had a closed end, you'd have a node. So again, you can always just sketch out what this looks like, right? So how if I if I have a pipe that's open at both ends, I have to have an anti-node at both ends. Right? And so um, again, keeping in mind what the full um, wave would look like, right? So this is going to be kind of a more of a cosine shape because we're thinking about it being open at both ends. But so the, the um, longest wavelength you can have is going from a peak to a trough there. OK. 
something. And then uh, the second harmonic would go basically uh, the full wavelength, right? So peak to trough, back up to peak again. And the third harmonic would get a whole wavelength and then a half again. And again, you can use our relationship, uh, velocity is frequency times wavelength. The velocity is, is going to be the same and just be the speed of sound for these cases. Uh, when you're talking about sound waves oscillating in, in cavities. Um, and so you can geometrically just figure out what the wavelength is and how that relates to the length of the pipe and then solve for what the frequency would be. Okay. But again, in this case, when you have the open pipe, you have some fundamental uh, first harmonic. The second harmonic is the frequency twice as high. And then the third harmonic is three times as high. Okay, when the pipe is closed at one end, uh, like the example we're going to look at right now of a clarinet, then you get a node here. Okay, so the longest wavelength that you can have is a node at the closed end and open at an anti node at the open end. And so that's only a quarter of the wavelength. Right, so we start with that, that the length of the pipe is one quarter of the wavelength. And then we can solve for the uh, frequency, right, if we know that. Um, Again, velocity is, sorry, this writing is terrible, frequency times wavelength. Right? And so then we can solve for frequency is velocity over wavelength. Right? So that's all that this is, right? It's the velocity over 4L because L is a quarter lambda. So then if I solve for lambda, I get 4L. So you just keep doing that and you can figure out what all the frequencies are. Okay, I'm going to do, demonstrate a standing wave with these two Coke bottles. They're a little bit different sizes, right? One's a little shorter than the other. I'm just going to blow over the top. So two different sizes, right? The smaller one, this is really weird because I'm backwards on the screen. So they have different natural frequency. The longer one has a lower uh, pitch because it's going to have a longer wavelength that sets up in that bottle. And then the shorter wavelength, a uh, shorter bottle will have a shorter wavelength and a, um, a higher frequency. Pretty cool. So let's try one example here. So we have a, a problem where we're going to try and figure out what the fundamental frequency is of clarinet. Um, okay. So we're given that the clarinet is 66 centimeters long, and uh, we want to know what the frequency of the lowest and next harmonic. So we want the uh, first and second harmonics. Okay, and it tells us that the speed of sound in warm air is 350 meters per second. Okay, so let's go over to our ladybug camera. Go into full screen. Okay, and let's sketch what this looks like. So we have a clarinet, um, and so we're going to model that as closed at one end and open at the other. Okay, the reed instruments are like that, right? Because it's a really tiny hole where you're putting the air through. Okay, so when we have, so our, our fundamental or our longest wavelength that we can put in here, right? We know that we have to have a node here and we have to have opens here. And so for this case, um, let's try a different color. We're just gonna get a quarter of a wavelength of the wave. It's hard to draw it so shallow. Okay, so this is the length of our pipe. And we know that, um, the length of the pipe is just fitting in a quarter of the wavelength. So if we solve for lambda, it's 4L. Okay, so then the next harmonic, again, we still have to have this here, right? And we still have to have an anti-node at the open end. And so I would kind of need to just sketch out what this is going to look like, right? So if I think of my sine curve, you know, starting at a a node here at the closed end. And I we already did this, right? We've already used that harmonic where we can get the 
um, this maximum at the pipe opening, the next one would occur here, right? So I'm gonna be in my uh, down phase. So, so meaning that I'm going up and down, so I get a half wavelength and then another quarter. So I'm getting three quarters of the wavelength. So let's see if I can space this out, right? Yeah, so something like that. And then usually you'll see this drawn, you know, with the the eight wave there too, right? But it, the, in sound, we're talking about these are um, points of pressure, maximum and minimum. Sound is a pressure wave. Okay, so in this case, the length of the pipe is fitting in three quarters of a wavelength. So lambda is four thirds L. Okay, and now we can just solve for what the frequencies are using our favorite wave equation. The velocity is frequency times wavelength. So we wanna know what the frequency is of these two um, harmonics, right? So frequency one is gonna be V over lambda one. Let's call that lambda one and lambda two, which is V over four L. And then frequency two is gonna be V over lambda two which will be V over four thirds L. If we flip our four thirds, we get three V over four L. Okay, so we know that just looking at this relationship, right, that V over four L is F1. So this is three times F1. Okay, so uh, let's plug in. So. For F1, we have our speed, 350 meters per second, divided by four, uh, and then 0.66 meters is the length of the pipe. And I think I calculated that already. Yeah, so we get 132.56 hertz. And if we round that to um, three significant figures, 133 hertz. And then for three times that, 397, um, so F2 is 3F1 equals 397.7 hertz. And again, if we round that, 398. Okay, so there we go. Okay, so uh, you guys know, right? A piano sounds different from a violin, and it sounds different from a cello or a trombone or uh, lots of different instruments. And so you can have an instrument that's playing the same fundamental frequency but it may have different harmonics um, that, it's also, that are also resonating in the instrument. And so that gives it the quality of sound that we hear. That, that's what distinguishes a clarinet from a piano, from a trombone or trumpet. Um, so these all these instruments all have the same fundamental frequency, but you can see that the, um, the other harmonics that are um, being uh, resonating in the instrument are different. And so it's, kind of, it's called a spectrum of sound and it's really cool, I think, that you can, uh, we'll do a couple of examples of how we can, um, you can actually, there are, you know, just on your phone using Firefox, you can create a spectrum of sound for different instruments and see what harmonics are there. Hey, I'm going to uh, use the Firefox app to show you um, a frequency spectrum. And so at first I'm going to play a guitar. So I'm just going to play the bottom note of a guitar. We'll get this going. I'm going to play here. Try that again. And so we'll look at this under the history setting, and it kind of tells us the uh, frequencies that we're seeing. So that's our guitar string, and I could play a different note, right? So on the x axis here, we're looking at the frequencies, 
And it's showing us that we see the fundamental note, but we also see a bunch of other frequencies that the guitar is playing. And that was actually picking up me, but. So it sounds like one note to us. But we see lots of different frequencies in the guitar string. So let's look at. All right, so let's look at the high E on the guitar. So it's kind of cool. And then let's look, listen to what the same note sounds like on the piano. So we see a different uh, spectrum of harmonics that come through. Now this is actually picking up my voice. OK, so uh, again, for anyone who uh, plays an instrument, or sings or whatever, um, if you're tuning an instrument, when usually you play a reference note and then you tune your instrument to that note. And as you get close, you hear, um, you'll start hearing beats, right? And you want, you, you know, when you're in tune, when those beats basically go away. So, so what you're hearing is um, the oscillation, it's the constructive or the interference of, of the two waves, right? So here's a, a wave at 50 hertz and one at 60 hertz. And again, if you go through and sum um, the amplitudes at every point, you get a, a big thing here, right? Because they're in phase, so they're going to add constructively. And then uh, we get to a point here where they're um, pretty much out of phase, right? So you get a, a minimum. And then if you keep going, right, they're adding in some in-between way. And here we get back to a maximum because they're both at the peak at the same time. And then here we get back to a minimum where they destructively interfere. And so if you look at the result and you get a big amplitude to a small amplitude to a big amplitude to a small amplitude. And so you hear this like pulsing wah, 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 of the notes uh, when, when you're really close together. And the frequency that you hear this um, up and down, right? The pulse, the pulse frequency is actually just the difference of the two frequencies. So in this case, um, you know, uh, 50, between 50 and 60 hertz, the um, frequency of a beating would be 10 hertz. And so in, within a tenth of a second, we've gone through one cycle there.